So let's continue with this uh, Kalman filtering introduction. So when we have the Kalman filter in place, or at least a mathematical uh, understanding of it, it would make sense to look at how to actually implement it. And for the first time to, to implement stuff like this, it is a good idea to, to get a sample data set, or maybe even you just uh, generate uh, by yourself. And then you try to plot the data. And that will give you quite a nice idea about um, some of the uncertainties related to the data. Is there um, what amount of noise can I expect on the sensor readings? And similarly, what is the uh, sample uh, time interval? Um, or is it always the same distance between? Uh, uh, samples or does that vary over time? That influences a, a bit on how to actually uh, deal with with these uh, things. Okay. So to figure out values for the process and the measurement covari covariance matrices, um, they often should be in the same uh, orders of magnitude, or at least within a factor of 10 from, from each other. Um, if they are further away from each other, then it means that either the process update or the measurement update will more or less be ignored by the Kalman filter, and therefore it will not really be used for, for anything in, in updating the state of the, the system. And then uh, goes the point of, of the Kelvin filter. Um, of course, if you make many measurements, you can have a, a higher uh, covariance matrix on the individual measurements, but over time it will still uh, converge. Uh, but it will take much longer time to track the, the state estimate in, in the proper direction. So uh, yeah, I more or less said it uh, earlier on how to, to estimate this uh, measurement noise. And if you can uh, plot it and see, okay, how large a distance does these uh, values vary from uh, whatever we would, would ex estimate, it will be a, a good estimate of, of the measurement noise that is present. So. A few things to, to consider when initializing uh, a Kalman filter is how to define its initial state. Um, and if you have an actual measurement uh, of a state, uh, you could use uh, that uh, measurement information to set that visible part of the state space to, to a certain value. Um, and then the remaining entries in, in the state uh, matrix of, of the system or the state vector of the system, uh, you can put that into whatever it'll be. Um, that can be either based on your experience or set it to zero or some something else. But what is important here is that you also set the uncertainty of the covariance matrix for the initial uh, state to some very large value, maybe a, a thousand or 10 to the 10th, um, which actually means that don't rely on this point at all when updating the system. Um, and then we can, can go on from, from there. So, which in, in fact means that the next update will start an and lower these uh, covariance matrices uh, quite significantly. So we get much closer to, to the true values. There are also a few elements related to timing of, um, of uh, such updates. And uh, 
one thing when you define this uh, state transition matrix, it often involves the uh, time or uh, the duration of the time step. Uh, so you can take the velocity of a, a, of a system and then multiply that with the uh, time increment to gain um, an idea about the, the change in, in position uh, in, within this model. And therefore you need to know the timing between uh, updates. There can also be some issues related to synchronization between elements of your system. Um, and therefore it uh, is it can be good to to be able to deal with what is known as variable time steps so you actually measure okay for how long time has, how long time how much time has passed since we made the last update and then uh, actually use that time for the prediction step in this uh, state update uh, matrix and there's also something on how to deal with uh, multiple sensors and I think we can actually uh, make a, a drawing from from that. So um, yeah, multiple sensors. So if we imagine we we have uh, some kind of uh, car right here, which is uh, going in in this direction, and we can think of it being equipped with uh, two different kinds of uh, sensors, uh, DPS, which is which makes it possible to to measure the position, and then we could say that it and it has some kind of IMU or accelerometer that can. Uh, measure the acceleration. If we want to to describe the system of, of this um, the state of this car we need to have a position, a velocity and an acceleration and that will be our uh, state vector. And we can also uh, consider okay what will be the update rates of uh, these different types of sensors. At GPS position you might get uh, that with uh, one update per second and then accelerometer you might have that with uh, 200 uh, hertz updates or something like that. So how to combine these kinds of, uh, of different sensors? One way of, of doing it would, would be the following. So you have your state here, and then uh, given your initial state, then you predict um, so one, uh, yeah. let's see, delta t is one over 200, so which matches the uh, the rate we get these accelerometer uh, readings from. I just realized I probably want to only state it's uh, 20 hertz accelerometers that we, we have here. Um, otherwise I'll use way too much time here. Then if after we have predicted the state we uh, say update based on uh, accelerometer, and then we could uh, repeat twenty times, and finally we need to update uh, based on on the GPS. And finally, we can go back and repeat this once again. In that way, we have made 20 uh, predictions where we have moved the system forward in time. And for each 
of these steps forward in time, we have um, updated the accelerometer uh, data of the acceleration part of, of the model here. And uh, finally, um, once a second, we also update the position based on, on the GPS uh, position measurements. And that will actually help us quite much in uh, assessing the state of the system. And this approach to dealing with uh, different kinds of uh, sensor readings with different update rates is very finely dealt with uh, using the, the Kalman filter. So that's one of the nice properties of, of this. So yeah, I think we got through all of this and the illustration I made before also um, explains exactly how to deal with missing measurements. You just predict based on, on your previous prediction and then you can go on from, from there. So to implement a Kalman filter in Ross, please be aware of, um, of this approach for, for doing it. Initially, try to implement it in an offline version where you have the data you want to track uh, available in a uh, ROS pack or something similar where you can uh, repeat it at, at will. You don't need to, to think much about timing and so on. Afterwards, you can go on and, and make an online version where you use the actual uh, time between uh, each step uh, to get the prediction step right. If you are using a, a multi-threaded system, please use mutexes um, to protect shared variables so you know that they are in a good state and not has been not some have been changed and others haven't been cha changed and so on. Um, and finally, it can be a good idea to predict uh, after an update or a certain uh, sample time has, has passed. So you use multiple uh, update or predict steps um, instead of just having a single prediction uh, step over a long uh, time. So far, so good. Uh, the Kalman filter works on what is known as linear systems. And now we'll take a, an example of something that the Kalman filter does not actually deal with uh, using uh, the, the standard approach. And this is um, a non-linear process here where we have a state vector uh, given by x, y, and um, phi. And the way to update the state vector is not something that can be written as a matrix um, multiplied with uh, the state vector. Uh, so therefore, it's a nonlinear process. In this case, it's a vehicle that drives with a velocity of vk, um, which is some kind of control input, I assume, in this direction, uh, phi k. So therefore, we should update the, the x and y coordinates using the vk times cosine and vk times sine, and both times uh, the time step. And the orientation of the vehicle should be updated with the um, angular velocity, phi k, or omega k, multiplied with uh, the time step. And the problem here is that we cannot find this uh, matrix uh, so that we could just multiply it and uh, with the uh, previous state vector and then get the, the new one. But we can get something that is, at least it's close to that by linearizing the, the system. Um, so we would figure out, okay, what is the value of cosine here? What is the value of sine? And then just leave that uh, as a value. And then we could write this update uh, matrix. It also means that we should update this uh, state transition matrix whenever this five variable changes, which it does on every step. Um, so it's a bit more tedious to, to do so, 
but we can still make it work. And this is known as uh, an extended Kalman filter to, to linearize the, um, this update process and uh, go on from, from there. And the good part about this is that it actually works quite well. And the extended Kalman filter, or EKF, uh, which is uh, written here, is it uses the exact same structure as the, the Kalman filter we, we looked at uh, earlier. The main difference is that this error current uh, matrix is updated in a slightly different way, because we need to take into account the, the Jacobian, and also the projected uh, state update is now a nonlinear function instead of this um, matrix mapping from the current state to, to the next. But apart from that, the structure is uh, the same uh, thing here. It can also contain this uh, measurement function here, where we have the um, you have a function x uh, h that uses the, the current estimate to give you what kind of uh, measurement you would expect to see, and then compare it with the actual measurement. Based on that, you again update it. So the structure is the same, but all the locations where you had non-linearities um, in the model of the system, you have kept these um, and want to change them to something uh, linear. These are these VK and WK uh, entries here. And then it uh, works out again. So for the mini project, you will have to, to employ a, a Kalman filter and use it to track multiple objects. And um, yeah, one approach for, for doing this is to tr um, make one Kalman filter tracker for each object you have detected. And each uh, tracker should both have an estimated pose of that object or vehicle you want to track and an associated covariance matrix. In addition to that, when you see something new that is moving in the scene, you should find the running uh, tracker that matches that as well as possible. Um, and then update the state of that based on this match. If you make a bad match, then uh, your input uh, is, is quite bad and, and the Kalman filter cannot account for, for that and you will be, be left with, with, uh, with bad performance of the system. But if you're able to increase the likelihood that you can actually make the right match then you are much better uh, going. And that can be based on, on different things. One idea is to actually use or provide some kind of signature um, for the object you want to track. So you're able to to specify it in, in, a, in a better way. That could be if you are somehow able to say that the red car is moving in this direction then all the other cars than the red ones can be uh, discarded, so you know exactly what to, to search for. And for a, some kind of signature for the objects to, to track, um, it might be possible to, to define a, a sort of unique feature for an object. So at, at least it uh, helps us pick exactly that object instead of other objects that are nearby. This will help us a lot to distinguish between uh, neighbor or adjacent uh, objects um, if they are not looking at exactly the same way. And one source of, of this is to actually use the, the methods we, we looked at earlier from analyzing motion in an image sequence to see, okay, pixels in this location, how have they moved how have they moved during the, the last few uh, frames and that will help us in, in what direction uh, to search for. Um, 
for the next update here. So again, I think it would make sense to, to think a bit about how could such a simple object signature looks like in an image. Take a, a small minute, a small, small break or pause here and, and try to, to think about this and then we will uh, go on. Some ideas for, for signatures here could be to look at either the color of an object, the size, shape, or some kind of pattern on, on the object. Uh, color could be the color information in RDB, color space, or CLAB, or whatever you, you want to look at. The size could be some quantification on the amount of pixels that belongs to, to this object. And the shape and pattern these could also be different features that might be, be more difficult to actually uh, specify in, in a proper way. But for for some um, some problems, they, they make good sense to, to look into. The size could either be some kind of, of radius or length or number of pixels within that object. And the color, yeah. I also men already mentioned some different... Uh, color spaces that we could represent colors within. So now we're more or less uh, finished. So today we talked about uh, Kalman filtering and uh, on, on Thursday we'll be using a perspective correction of images to look at how we can stabilize a video from a UAV and also how to map things we have seen from a, a tilted camera in a UAV down to a, a planar surface. Um, and we'll use that in the in the coming mini project where you should be able to track small cars uh, or cars in in a real road uh, or intersection and be able to uh, describe what are their velocities and uh, how are they changing uh, position over time using uh, Kalman filters and this kind of um, motion detection in, in images that we looked at uh, last week. Good. So that was uh, the lecture about Kalman filtering. I hope you, you learned a bit from it. <laughs>